Good morning, everyone. Can I get everybody to come in and sit down, please? My name's Dan Hahn, and I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. Got sober July 18th of 07. Got lucky. Moved into a good Oxford house. I want to welcome everyone to the 2021 Oxford House World Convention. As a reminder, masks must be worn indoors and properly. You know what properly means? No, no chin diapers. Get them up over your nose, please. Lanyards and name badges are required to enter sessions. Silent your cell phones during these sessions. Be respectful of the colored bracelets and people's contact preference. Keep your QR code on your name badge clear so we can scan you into sessions. The only smoking and vaping area we have is outside between the ballroom and the parking garage. Don't smoke near the doors and please dispose of butts properly. One of the other things that I personally ask of you guys is not to use those side doors there and go completely out the back because the, the hotel uh, strongly frowns on smoking in that corridor there. D um, also, you, download the app and don't forget to rate, your, uh, rate these sessions on those apps. The AA meetings have been moved to National Harbor 3 and the NA meetings have been moved to National Harbor 10. So the, the panel that you've all attended this morning is uh, the drug court and reentry panel. Um, I was really, really lucky um, that the last case that I went into to jail on, I did six months and, and was on the verge of a jury trial. I had been to prison twice before and I was facing prison a third time. And was that, that fortunately, they let me out on a, a 10 year supervised probation, which I managed to walk down. And now Oxford House was a big part of that. Years ago, I, I, in Wichita, Kansas, I walked up to a gentleman that's, he's here in the convention today. I walked up to Victor Fitz. He's a former world council chair of ours. And I asked him what I could do to help get people out of prison. And, you know, he told me some of the best advice I ever had. He, he asked me if my rent was current. He asked me if I was a um, accepted member of the house. I said, yes. And he said, I'm here to point you in the right direction, but I'm not going to do it for you. You'll figure it out. And so reentry has been something that I've been involved with since I got into Oxford House. And I just want everyone to know what a true honor it is to be on this stage with the, the great folks that we have assembled. And we're going to get through this panel and, and hopefully you guys can learn something. And I'll try to get it wrapped up so we have time for some questions and then we can get everybody to lunch. So over three quarters of the Oxford House population has done some jail or prison time. In America today, approximately 60% of those in jails or prison are addicted to alcohol and or drugs. Each year, thousands of those who are incarcerated reenter society. However, with one year, with, within one year of reentry, about half of the individuals commit, will commit another crime and be headed to conviction and re-entry to incarceration. The experience of those who enter an Oxford House following incarceration or drug court intervention is usually long-term reco long recovery and crime-free behavior. In some states, Oxford House has developed relationships with re-entry programs that permit those from leaving incarceration to go straight into an Oxford House. Amen, right? Amen. Other residents come to Oxford House. Uh, they, they, other, other residents come to Oxford House they live in. Well, this is, I got it. I can't, I'm having a hard time seeing. I need y'all to be patient with me. Other residents come to Oxford House at the recommendation of drug courts or parole officers who have found that their clients tend to do well if they live in an Oxford house. Not only does such intervention motivate clients to begin to master the recovery process, it also saves taxpayers the cost of incarceration and recidivism. Oxford house residents who enter an Oxford house to leadership positions and undertake shared responsibility for the operation of the house. Most residents rise to the occasion. Thank God I did. The kind of real life training is rare for most individuals reentering society. This panel will discuss, number one, the need for post-incarceration recovery opportunities, practical, number two, practical ways to facilitate getting individuals leaving incarceration into an Oxford house, and three, 
how Oxford Houses can help drug court clients achieve long-term recovery and meet the expectations of the drug courts, and how Oxford House Living Facilities, the transition to, living facilitates the transition to long-term crime-free recovery for most residents. These panelists assembled today are experienced in this field. Um, and, they, and they are, and I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. So the first person that we're gonna bring up today to talk to you is Mr. Terrence Walton. Terrence is among the nation's leading experts in providing training and technical assistance to drug courts and other problem-solving courts. Prior to being named CEO in 2015, Terrence Walton was the NADCP Chief of Standards. In addition to being responsible for the daily operations of NADCP and planning the national conference, he retains his responsibility for establishing and implementing best practice standards nationwide. Terrence Walton has directed programs in Dayton, Ohio and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He has helped evaluate a million dollar White House anti-drug media campaign and served on the Substance Abuse Task Force as part of the White House Best Practices Collaborative. In addition to his, his extensive work domestically, he has assisted addiction treatment programs in Bangladesh, Barbados, Guam, Mexico, and Bermuda. Terrence Walton is an internationally certified alcohol or other drug abuse counselor with over 25 years of experience helping individuals and organizations champion positive change. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology and a Master of Social Work degree with specializations in program administration and substance abuse. Noted for his practical strength-based approaches to complex issues, Terrence Wal Walton is actively sought out for insight on treating and supervising justice system involved individuals who are living with substance abuse and mental health disorders. Terrence Walton is a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, a gifted and entertaining speaker. Terrence Walton travels extensively informing and inspiring audiences around the globe. I give you Terrence Walton. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Oxford House. Good there we go. I'm used to being talked back to. Uh, listen, by the way, I, I meant to tell you only to read a portion of that, but I started my timer when he started talking, so we'll be okay. I do want to be able to get to your questions. Uh, it is my honor to be here on behalf of the National Association of Drug Corps Professionals, uh, as well as the, 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 the thousands and thousands of treatment professionals, recovery management professionals who work in treatment courts all across this country and beyond. Um, as you just heard, you know, I've had, I have a lot to do at my organization. I have a lot to do with my organization, but my number one commitment in life, well, my number one commitment is, of course, to my wife and my, my two small children, that's number one. But once that commitment is taken care of, uh, my life is very much dedicated to helping to free men and women from addiction. And, and for most of my career, for most of my career, that has involved helping people who are helping people break free. And so um, you actually honor me, you know, and, and, and it's my honor to be here today doing what is my calling. And I'm especially, this is not my first time, of course, being at this convention, but it's my first time speaking on behalf of my organization. And, and, and what I want to leave you with in, my, in just the 10 minutes or so I'm going to talk is a good sense of what treatment courts are and how essential I believe housing, and in particular Oxford houses, are to the success of the men, women, and, and families that we serve. That comes both from my perspective as a leader in the treatment court movement, but also from my more than 30 years of experience helping people to break free from addiction. I think there is almost nothing that matters more than housing. So let's get started. Is uh, that gonna show up there too? Or? Yeah, I need to. There you go. Good. So let's talk about a, a little bit about treatment courts. You know, I have to do that this piece because I'm, I'm, I'm advocate for treatment courts. So I gotta do this piece too. Uh, most of you know what treatment courts are, but I don't know. I can't assume everyone does, even today. My mother sometimes says, now what do you do again? 
<laughs> Tell me again, what you what, what do you do for a living? It's, it's you know, uh, those of us in the middle of it think it's known by all, but not necessarily. Treatment courts began in 1989 at the height uh, or, or at the you know really really the 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 the, the beginning and 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 growing point of the crack cocaine epidemic. It really was uh, the awareness from judges and prosecutors that so many of the people that was coming in and out of their courtrooms were there not because they were hardened criminals, not because they had some great moral deficiency, not because they were antisocial, because they were living with addiction. And as treatment providers got involved and researchers got involved, there was the increasing awareness that addiction is a long way from using because you want to. You'll all know this. It's a long way from using because you like it. It's using even once you stop liking it. It's using even when you have promised yourself and meant it, promised your loved one, promised your children, your parents, the judge, the PO, that I'm done, that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and yet it returns. So the awareness that simply locking people up simply putting people on probation and saying, well, go to treatment. But that wasn't enough. Now it's enough for some people. Some people, that, if you give them quality treatment, quality recovery management, an Oxford house, that's all they need. And NADC, people, and NADCP believes that no one should be in a drug court who doesn't need it. If they, if they can go to treatment, get the treatment they need, get the recovery support they need without the involvement of the judge and all the structure of a drug court, that's what should happen. Treatment courts are for people who have been identified through assessment as not just having a high need, not just living with moderate to severe substance use disorder, but have also been identified through assessment that this individual is unlikely to succeed, unlikely to get off probation without getting revoked, unlikely to continue in treatment long enough for the magic to happen. And instead, they're going to get rearrested and end up incarcerated. And then when they come out, the same thing happens all over again. That's who treatment courts are for. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if you know, but, you know, the treatment courts began as pretrial programs. We still have pretrial drug courts, like the large one right here in Washington, D.C., where you don't have to plead guilty to get in. We, that's where I was there 15 years. We, we treat lots of people in that treatment court. We had good relationships with local Oxford houses there. It's also for many of those who are on probation, uh, those who are reentering. We have adult, regular adult courts, veterans courts, juvenile courts, DWI courts, mental health courts, family courts. All of those are available today, more than almost 4,000 across the country. You talk, you'll hear from Judge Stoner in just a minute, and we're just talking about what a great name Judge Stoner has for the work he's, he's doing. Uh, couldn't be more perfect. Uh, it's about the team, folks. It's about who's at the table. It's about the judge and it's about the prosecutor understanding that while her or his commitment is always to public safety, that the very best way for this person, for the person who is involved in the justice system because of addiction or mental illness, the very best way to protect the public and to respect the rights of victims is by doing everything we can do to help that person get effective treatment and recovery management so we stop the revolving door. Prosecutors and defense attorneys and POs, their ultimate goal doesn't change. What they're most concerned about is still the same, but there's a coming together, a collaborative agreement that in this case, we ought to wrap all of our resources, all of our perspectives around helping this person to enter recovery and give them all the support and accountability they may need for it to happen. You know, when I was treating directly, I work with young people when I was doing direct services, and someone told me, if you can treat effectively young people, you can treat anybody. I think that's true. And you know, we did a lot of good things. I was pretty green, but we, fit, we did some good stuff in there in creating positive peer cultures and encouraging positive youth development and helping kids, most who weren't addicted, but they were using and certainly on their pathway there, uh, helping them to discover purpose in life and, and, and making drugs where it's like irrelevant but they didn't need that to be a part of their life because they were finding set satisfaction and purpose in other areas and finding ways to deal with the stress they were under. And, 
and you know, we did good work, but the hardest part was getting folks to keep coming back, to come long enough for it to work. And that's where drug courts can help out. So Judge will say a little bit more about that, but I guess I wanna you know, wrap up by really emphasizing, and this is, I'd be saying this if I wasn't here at the Oxford House Convention, uh, that you know, housing, you know, a safe and, and, and sober place to live, to reside, um, is critical. I can't tell you how many people I have seen through the programs that I have helped to run and what I've seen across the country over the last eight or nine years I've been with drug courts in this capacity is that so many people, they get a great start. They get effective treatment, they do. You know, some it involves medication, some doesn't. They get ingrained in the, in, in, in usually the 12-step fellowships, other support groups as well, but most people uh, today, you know, benefit from 12-step fellowships. You know, most have no objection to that, and that's, that's what's helping them the most, and they get ingrained in that. They're on the right path. They got the right support. They develop the motivation, insight, and skills necessary to get better. They're doing well. And then they go back home. All the structures loosen. And their reality takes over. And their environment pulls them back. It's happened again and again. So housing matters to all of us, but housing is essential for recovery. Affordable, safe housing is important for folks coming into treatment courts, you know, just to get stabilized. I've said to my treatment folks, if a person doesn't have a safe, supportive place to live, if they, if they're, if they have housing insecurity, if they're not sure exactly where they'll be living next month, or if where they're living, somehow they're in danger there, that, that their focus is not going to be recovery and shouldn't be. It's about survival. <laughs> Their focus is going to be survival. And so job one in treatment courts and other treatment programs is you got to get people stable. You know, how do we get them stable? At the very beginning, before we begin the hard work of day by day learning to live without substances or other addictive behaviors. It's for stabilization. Once they're in treatment, you know, uh, uh, it'll become important all along the way, being sure they have a stable sober place to reside, especially if they're not in residential treatment and when they get out of treatment. And it's also an important part of continuing care. And this is where I've seen it drop off sometimes, that people just don't have that place to go, that place to live that is safe and sober. And that's where in communities where Oxford house, houses exist, um, and if the drug court team was aware of them, and if they're at the table, uh, it can make a huge difference. And, uh, you know, some of y'all can go back to your Psych 101 classes, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and, and then you, you, you may have also heard about SAMHSA's four dimensions of recovery, home, health, community, purpose, that, that those physiological needs, that very, that very bottom is the basic. And to me, this is the pro progression of recovery. And unless that is stabilized, nothing can really begin and nothing can be sustained. So what I say to you, wherever you are in the Oxford House world, that what you are doing is saving lives. And in those communities where somehow treatment courts and Oxford Houses have found ways to combine, that dramatically improves the outcome that they'll be able to get well. And, 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 and avoid crime and raise their children and be there every day when their kids wake up. That matters. Get jobs, we can, and, and then most of all, find purpose. Find purpose. So listen, folks, as far as I'm concerned, what matters most is that if there is an Oxford house in the same community, in the same city, in the same town, as a treatment court, then Oxford House needs to be at the table. Drug courts today have peers. They're not a part of the professional team. They're not involved in sanctioning and all of that, but they are peers who are on the team to help advise the team, to help support the participant, help walk with them on that journey. If there's an Oxford House alumni or, or others who can be a part of the treatment court team, um, 
I, I, I'm just convinced it can make all the difference in the world. And I, we're actually you know, trying to work out with our funders to do some research to prove that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I am so looking forward to answering some questions. I need to know what's on your mind and I hope we can stay connected. My email address is on, always on my last slide, twaltonallrise.org. That's for real. If you reach out, I'll reach back. Let's stay connected. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sorry about that PowerPoint. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence, very much. Our next speaker is Judge Kenneth Stoner. Judge Stoner began his legal career over 20 years ago as an assistant DA. He later went into private practice where he concentrated on representation of clients suffering from addiction and mental health issues. Judge Stoner has earned a distinction for his innovative approach to handling such cases which led to the governor appointing him to the position of district court judge where he now oversees Oklahoma County's treatment courts, drug DUI veterans court, and the groundbreaking Remerge Women's Diversion Program. And I've personally seen as, as when I was an outreach worker in Oklahoma County um, several years back, the difference that Judge Stoner's programs made and the power of, of the change that came in here that he brought with his innovative approaches. And we're very honored and excited to have him here. So, Judge Stoner. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, right before this virus thing is going around, you guys ever heard about that? Um, before that, I was, uh, I spent a lot of time traveling and speaking, and I, every chance I get, I'll, I want to talk to our leaders in our community about why it's so much more important to treat rather than incarcerate. And I remember there was this one group that I was really wanting to impress. And whenever you, whenever you talk to a group, it's always good to start with some humor, right? So I was asking my wife, I was like, what? I, I gotta have something funny to say to these people. I said, it's really important to make a great impression. And she said, you know, I think you should just skip it. You're really not that funny. <laughs> and I said, no, hold, I said, hold on, no, pe that's not true. People laugh at my jokes all the time. And she said, oh, honey, bless your heart. They laugh because you're the judge. <laughs> um, like, well, just, just remind everybody that your name is Judge Stoner, it's funny enough, and just go on. So there, there you have it. Um, but uh, we, uh, I see Oklahoma in the house, by the way. Give a shout out here. All right, very good. Uh, I, I'm, we do have a really strong treatment court in Oklahoma County, and I'm really proud. Our, our graduation rate uh, is 84%. That means more than four out of five people. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm saying, we take the hard cases too. This is not, you know, this is not cherry picking, that we take the hard cases, but. If you compare that to the state average graduation, it's about 66%. So um, I'm not trying to be boastful about it or prideful. What I'm saying is I really think a big part of the success of our program is our strong relationship with Oxford. I mean, you could just as uh, Terrence was saying, you know, having safe, safe, stable, sober housing is such a key ingredient. And if we didn't have that, I mean, we do have a pretty skilled team. We are really committed to best practices, but if we didn't have that, and so I just wanna thank you and everybody from Oxford, because I think you guys deserve a lot of the credit for man, helping people not go to prison and change their lives and you know, take care of their kids. Um, so I wanna uh, share a couple ideas with you here. We're gonna talk about the need, the need, and then how we all can work together just from here. And uh, I have a, uh, a couple quotes from uh, this Will Rogers, Brian Stevenson, and Steve Martin. I showed my teenagers this slide. They didn't know who these people were. <laughs> and uh, matter of fact, they said, if I'm not quoting to Kanye or some guy named Tyler, the creator, I don't, I'm going to be relevant. So I guess I'm really not very cool. But um, the, uh, by the way, I'm just kind of curious, how, who, how many people here are in or, in or have been in a drug court? <laughs> All right. Yeah. How about prison? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. You are you are my people. Okay, I'm being I'm being serious. I, the uh, a lot of times if I have a chance to hang out, I'd rather hang out with people who have had your experiences than than rather hang out with some of the judges I get to hang out with. They're not 
nearly as interesting or creative or, uh, and so you are my people. In fact, I do wanna, uh, and by the way, if those of you that didn't raise your hand, uh, who's lying? That's <laughs> kidding. Uh, <laughs> it does take a lot of courage to admit that, and I, I know being in prison has a kind of a stigma associated with it, and I think, uh, I, I gotta say, man, I gotta, some of the most amazing, beautiful, spiritually gifted people I've ever met have, have had to go to prison a couple of times. I mean, it's just, yeah. They're just, there's just something about that. I mean, sometimes it's when you're cracked and you're broken, that's when the light gets in and they're just, they're just amazing people. So um, anyway, so I, I think it would be wise for us to kind of figure out how to let go of some of that stigma because we know that your past does not have to equal your future. Um, man, people can and do change. I want to spend just a, a couple of minutes talking. If, you, if you're not familiar with drug courts, I've got to give a little bit of information about drug courts so that you really understand why this is so important. Uh, sometimes we're here to talk about how to make the connections. Sometimes understanding the why is really important to, to, to the how. And uh, you guys kind of understand the why a little bit. But um, there are about 3,300 treatment courts in the United States, mental health courts. Um, we work really closely with NADCP, Pre Terrence is the president, um, our National Drug Court Institute. There's something called Justice for Vets. We have a veteran treatment court in our community. There's also something called Tribal Healing to Wellness Courts. And since there's 3,300 of these in the United States, very likely you've got them all around you. Um, treatment courts work. They're not like your average adversarial proceeding. You know where your lawyers are fighting with each other, and uh, this is a this is a really a collaborative effort uh, where the lawyers work with treatment providers, work with a probation officer and a judge, and they're all specially trained. Instead of in fighting with uh, with each other and arguing each other, what we do is we problem solve. We problem solve. Like, how do we figure this out? I mean, how do we how do we help give the person the right amount of support, encouragement, and accountability? And typically, these programs last anywhere between eighteen. 24 months, sometimes up to 36 months, depending on how long it takes, as Terrence said, for the magic to happen. Um, and we do not give sanctions to punish people. We don't like to punish people. We do give sanctions, though, sometimes to spark motivations to make change. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not interested in punishing people, but I do have to figure out like, what, how do we give you the right level of sanction to get you to change your behavior, maybe change your thoughts and beliefs, or maybe a sanction in order to uh, maybe give you some insight into why, why we do what we do. Uh, why do you do what you do? And we also want to give a lot, a lot of encouragement because some of the effort that people put in these programs is absolutely amazing. I mean, some for some people, it's like the equivalent amount of effort as like climbing Mount Everest. You know, it's just so much effort and it's really worth a lot of uh, celebration support. One thing that there's a big misunderstanding about addiction is that in the kind of out in the, in the community is a lot of people think that, well, the problem is just about you just need to quit using. It's just you just need to quit. And it's kind of what we call reductionist thinking. It's just like there's a really simple solution here and the simplest solution is you should just quit. Um, and I mean, that might, reductionist thinking works for simple problems like resetting a broken arm. You just kind of get it back together and it does. But you have to understand addiction is a systems issue. It's not just one thing. It's having number one, safe, stable, sober housing. It's healthy relationships and positive peer association. It's starting to sound like Oxford. You gotta watch your physical health, employment, access to meaningful work, uh, spiritual, a sense of uh, uh, spirituality. And, and if you don't have a, uh, a lot of history with the religious tradition, that's okay because in the recovery community, a sense of spirituality is, is, the, is that, that which is between and that which is beyond. You know, it's kind of a mystery, but if you understand man, that there, whatever this is that we have between us and whatever that is that we have beyond us, and you try to understand that the nature and maybe even the mystery of that, it starts getting really interesting. Sober fun, meaning and purpose, healthy habits, going to sleep on time, getting up on time, being in good um, uh, routines, um, community connections. I, one, one helpful analogy, and I made this slide myself, I'm not the best at it, but imagine being stuck in a traffic jam and this is a traffic jam, and you're looking at all the back windshields of a, of a car. And so the person down here in the, is in the far right corner of a light blue car, and the substance use is right in front of them. But imagine being stuck in traffic, and if people say, well, if you could just quit, that'd be like just taking the car that's right in front of them out. The substance use is gone. But guess what? You're still stuck in traffic. Matter of fact, that car can't move until the one in front of it can move. 
and that car can't move until the one in front of that can move. And so everybody's situation is a little bit different. Everybody's traffic jam is a little bit different, but that's what we do in treatment courts is how do we get up in front of the traffic, find those cars up front, and how do you get the whole system to kind of start moving at the same time? So that's whenever a lot of times people come in and they think recovery is about stopping. I'm like, no, man, it's about starting. It's about starting work in a program, getting your traffic moving, finding a sense of purpose, finding, getting uh, engaged in healthy habits and good sleeps and peer connections. And, and it's about starting much rather than it's about stopping. So um, what does success look like? It looks a lot more, <laughs> people think it looks like, oh, you just kind of go to treatment to get better. It actually, it's kind of a messy process. A lot of times it's, it's uh, two steps forward and one back. This is entry. This is actually uh, this is actually the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 2009 to 2018. And when I saw this, it's like that kind of reminds me of recovery a little bit. Uh, it is the nature of evolution and the way that. And, and by the way, just because you see a dip, that does not mean it's a relapse. It just means like life happened. You know, sometimes the the engine blew out. Sometimes grandma died. Sometimes you lost something that was important to your relationship or a financial setback. But that's why having surrounded by peers and support and encouragement, because this is what it looks like. You will have bad days. There is a roller coaster. And if you're not surrounded with a lot of people that you can help and that can help you, man, a lot of times if you have a bad day, it's hard to forget where you came from and where you started. Treatment courts are incredibly powerful for creating a safe community. And that's just one thing that's often overlooked. But this is an analysis of what they call a meta-study. A meta-study is a study of studies. And there's been a lot of research on this. So this first study, Mitchell, was 92 drug courts that were researched. The second was 23 drug courts. A lot of different meta-study, study, studies. And they say the question was, how much does drug courts reduce crime in your community? And on average, if you have a good drug court, it reduces crime in your community by about 10%. It makes your community a lot safer. And so not only are you helping people, but you're, you know, that not go to prison, but you're really helping your community be much more stable. Um, money invested in treatment courts, you get a great return on it. On average, you get about, well, anywhere between three and four dollar return for every dollar that's invested in a treatment court, you get that much benefit back in the community. And I, by the way, I don't know anybody that gets like a 400% return on their IRA, so that's a pretty good deal. Um, treatment courts do work. What people have to understand, not only can people change, the change is not just possible, but it is probable and predictable if you'll follow a path. If you'll follow a path, if you'll do and learn and grow like other people. Um, Actually, we have four out of five people graduate. This is not necessarily the case with every treatment court. Um, there are varying degrees of quality of drug courts out there. You know, you'll see that some are more receptive and some that are not. Um, but I, I, I do believe it is probably the thing that consistently in the criminal justice system that gets the gold star. Uh, it's, one of, it's one of the things the criminal justice does well. I mean, for the most part. Uh, there's still room for grow and improve, but Unfortunately, not every treatment, not every court out there is a treatment court. And so if you're caught up in a criminal case and you don't have access to a treatment court, you probably don't have a judge that understands the situation. As a matter of fact, um, in many cases, the lack of training in the legal profession not only doesn't help, it makes things worse. Um, and uh, what I, and this is a, a kind of a criticism of my own profession, is that um, for a, for a, profession like lawyers and judges who claim to value evidence, we've actually been not very good at it. Uh, because if you're not in a treatment court, I mean, there is not a single class in law school about addiction. There's not, lawyers aren't trained on it. In 2018, there wasn't even a single continuing education class put on by our Bar Association about addiction, yet it is the dominant issue. There's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of prejudice. And um, matter of fact, in my community, we did a survey that about 75% of all the criminal cases, substance use, abuse, addiction was a relevant factor. Uh, half of all our guardianships and divorces, substance use, abuse, ad and addiction was a relevant factor. 83% of children that go into DHS custody, the allegation is the home is unfit due to substance use, abuse, and addiction. And yet there is so little training outside of, outside of uh, treatment courts. And, and it, it's a shame because a lot of bias and prejudice. And um, this is, there's a, this guy here, Will Rogers, he's, he's from Oklahoma, Claremore, Oklahoma, by the way. He says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Um, 
And, and I think that kind of explains a lot what goes in, into a lot of judges and a lot of lawyers. They just don't understand it, matter of fact, but they're convinced that they do uh, because they think they've been around it. And uh, like I said, it ends up causing more harm than good. But Oxford can be part of that solution, being by ambassadors and, and great examples of your past does not have to equal your future. It is time that we have to think differently. In our state, we do have an incarceration crisis. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work well. It is expensive and inefficient. It tends to make lower risk people worse. And if you're a higher risk people, it tends to have no or negative effect. Uh, higher risk, as he was saying, is that they, they just are more likely to not stay in treatment long enough. It doesn't treat or cure addiction or mental illness. And this is a big thing when you think about, most people will not argue with me whenever I say, well, if you have diabetes before you go to prison, you'll probably have diabetes when you get out, right? Yeah, okay. Well, guess what? If you got schizophrenia before you go to prison, you'll be schizophrenic when you get out. If you have addiction before you go to prison, you'll have addiction when you get out, unless you have access to meaningful treatment and support, encouragement, housing, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, the, uh, most people that go to prison, 93% come back in our community to live with us, and we gotta figure out who we want as, uh, over our neighbors. Now, how do, you, how do we help? This is a guy named Brian Stevenson. He's this amazing guy, he's definitely a lawyer. He has uh, been featured in a movie called Just Mercy. I don't know if you've seen it. He just said, if you want to solve a problem, you got to get close to it. You got to get close. I'm asking off Oxford, you guys have, to, I want you to get close to your treatment course, get close to your probation officer, figures out how these things work. How do you partner with them? Uh, I'm going to keep going here. One of the things I want people to, what Oklahoma does really well is our application system. You know, you know, people that are in a treatment court, getting the applications in and process reviewed and getting that done quickly so that they can get out of jail and into treatment and so figure out how your uh, process is working. Um, this next guy, this is, a, this is a bit of advice. This is Steve Martin. I grew up watching him on Siren Live. He's amazing, but, but most people don't know this. In the beginning, he was actually kind of a nerd. He wasn't very funny. He's like, man, I keep going to these auditions. And I keep going to these auditions and, I, and no one will pick me. And he wrote a book. It was his, um, this is his autobiography. It's called Born Standing Up. And what he said uh, is probably some of the best advice is that whenever you're thinking, how is it that our, our house can work with a treatment court? What he said was, be so good they can't ignore you. Be so good they can't ignore you. I mean, know how to run a house. If you really want to run a, uh, if you really want to work with a good treatment court, um, run a great house. And that doesn't mean you're not gonna have problems. If you have problems, just make sure you're dealing with them in a principled way. And by running a great house and, and, and staying involved and engaged, and at some point uh, the word will get out. I'm curious, by the way, who on here has good relationships with their local treatment court? Yeah, all right. How about who, who all has friction with their local treatment courts? A couple. That's great news. Well, okay, sorry about that. Uh, you know, it's, but it, it's, it's just work to be done. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just like, don't give up, keep, keep working. Uh, remember in your houses, this is a systems issue. Um, and uh, I do have some Judge Stonerisms, but I'm out of time, so we'll probably cover them in our questions. And um, if I can ever help you, what's my favorite? Your tribe is your vibe. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, uh, if I can ever do anything for you, this Oxford having this I love this. I love this. Is family, community, and culture. Uh, everything I'm describing about what works is really what makes treatment courts work. Is really what makes. I mean, what Oxford makes work is really what helps us do so well. So, anyway, um, if I can ever do anything for you, look me up. Uh, there's my email address, my phone number, and uh, I look forward to getting to know you better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. That was great. Um, next up is Barbara Kidder. Barbara is reentry coordinator for Oxford House Incorporated, state of North Carolina. Since January of 2020, she has aided in the transition of hundreds of formerly incarcerated individuals into Oxford houses across the state of North Carolina. Prior to working with the reentry population, Barbara assisted in the implementation of several new Oxford houses. Barbara has the ability to connect with anyone she comes in contact with and always brings a unique perspective to any situation she has met with. Ladies and gentlemen, Barbara Kidder. Good morning, family. Um, I am a woman 
in recovery, which means for me that I haven't found it necessary to use a mood or mind altering substance December 20th of 2016. Mm. Oh. Um, kind of want to give you a little bit of an idea of me. Um, I have too been to prison. I got out of March 2015. At that point, um, I did not have a resource coming out. I went back to what I knew, uh, and I used that same very day. How many of you guys have used the same day getting out? Yeah. And, uh, you know, some other things had happened, and I ended up being on the streets, and uh, which almost took my life. Um, and after going to treatment and the suggestion of going to an Oxford house, um, it really meant a lot to me walking into that Oxford house when they told me welcome home because I hadn't had a home. Um, the worst feeling is not feeling good enough, not feeling like my kids want me in their lives, not feeling like I have a purpose and meaning. I felt like that every day. And even incarcerated, I didn't know what I was supposed to be. I felt... Um, broke down, put down, you know, and I understand staff does what they're supposed to do in those facilities, but a lot of them don't know what we've been through, through the addiction and, and the terrors of what it has caused for us. So I decided to get involved and uh, I wanted to start helping people like me because I've watched many people get out of prison and just die. They didn't have that barrier to kind of help them transition smoothly and have a safe place so it was very important to me to start picking up that phone when a case manager called a house that I was living at. And um, so I wanted to help that transition and kind of encourage the house that I lived in at that time. Let's get these people these interviews. You know, they have nowhere to go and we can help them. Then I started working with my two co-workers that I have today, Jesse Wilson and Holly Hart, which I'm telling you guys, two amazing people have showed me how this works. I'm very passionate, and I was like, man, I really want to become a part of this because I was never a part of anything. Uh, and Oxford House, sticking with it, man, you guys, I'm grateful today. It has saved my life. I'm given the opportunity to work for Oxford House and help save other lives. So being a reentry coordinator, it's a huge deal for me. You know, being that person to help someone transition smoothly into an Oxford house. Um, the worry, because you're sitting there, you can't pick up the phone, you can't make those phone calls for yourself. You know, hey, can I get some help when I get out? Me, Jesse, and Holly, that's what we do. We set up interviews with these case managers. We do pre-screens. We go over the charges. Now, again, I know some of y'all know about infractions. We've all been there, so I kind of don't really go into it too much unless you're setting a fire. Kind of worry about that a little bit. Um, but outside of that, the other part of our job is contacting the house and hopefully the house will get with the other house members and understand that it is important that we need to get this done in a timely manner because these people get released. They get thrown out and it's time to go. And most of them go to a homeless shelter, if not back to the streets. So their chances aren't very good. The other part um, that I like most is what I have the ability to do today is go around to the chapters talk about reentry, get people involved, start subcommittees. Um, I've done this wonderful thing with uh, North Carolina, some of our areas, we started these subcommittees where we have like a donation chair, resource chair, fundraiser chair. We have these people that meet every month. And so when I, I get somebody coming out in an area, Jesse or Holly will send them a message and say, hey, can you meet this person at a house? You know, some of them don't have clothes. Some of them don't have bedding. They don't have any resources whatsoever. And uh, so we get a list of resources that we put it in a packet so they can call the places that they need, they need to for themselves. Um, mental health is a big issue, you know, going in there. I can tell you when I was in prison, they drove me crazy. I was ready to strangle somebody when I got out. So those things are very important to know that we have that extra help. And I like the fact that we have more of a peer support with us. Oxford House, man, it's a family. You don't come in alone anymore. Once you show up, you're a part of that family. And that was something I can tell you saved my life, you guys. And some of these people need that. Uh, 
My mouth is really dry. This is nerve wracking. Um, <laughs> so this past fiscal year, we have placed over 240 individuals in North Carolina. Um, I'm gonna tell you, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and working with the, the whole team of North Carolina, I mean, we all, I can call anybody and everybody's ready. Come on, let's go. Let's get this person, you know, a bed. Let's come on, let's somebody show up at the house. You know, we have these book bags that we put toiletry kits in. We have towels, you know, um, and sometimes I've had people when I drop them off to them, just say thank you and cry. And I remember what it was like just just get a nice bar soap, you know, to have a fresh new towel to dry off with when I got to take my first shower. Um, it was really amazing. It, and it means a lot to me. Part of what I, I wanted to stand up and, and ask y'all to do is be a service for those coming out in your areas. You know, talk about it a little bit more. You know, um, be more a service. Pick them up, take them to a meeting, show them what it's like to be in recovery with a family. Um, not really sure what more I can really tell you. I can take a lot of questions after this or even on this, but at the end of the day, um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to see every beautiful person in this room and we don't have to keep ending up the same road over and over and over again if we just help each other. So thank you. That's all I got. Wow, thank, thank you, Barbara. I think it's clear that we have some success with reentry, right? There's a living example. Okay, the, our next speaker, I've had the privilege of knowing for, I don't know, quite a while now. I, I'd have seven, eight years probably. And um, this gentleman's actions through, through helping others are, are done. Uh, he's not necessarily the one you're never gonna see him saying, look what I did or being out, uh, you know, showboating about it, out in the front of everything, being loud and boisterous. You know, he doesn't, he's, he's one of those guys that's in the background silently working and doing some of the best work. And, but he has something very powerful to say, and I've been honored to know him over the years. His name's Hiram Torres. He moved into, he moved into Oxford House 2009 in that area. He's been the chapter, he's been a chapter chair, a vice chair, a male HSC chair, a regional chair, a, a regional office chair, a finance chair, helped start reentry programs in the south region of Texas, and currently lives in San Antonio. Helps out any, any way he can with opening new houses, struggling houses. He spent a, a tw over 20 years in prison and just wants people to know there's a different way to live. And he currently lives in Oxford House Davis where he has resided since 2011. So I give you Hiram Torres. Hey, what's up everybody? My name's Hiram Torres. I'm a person in long-term recovery. What that means for me is uh, I haven't had to have a drink or a drug since August the 13th of 2006. <clears throat> Every time I say that, I get emotional because it's crazy, you know? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my story. Uh, I went to prison at 16. I was 16 years old when I went to prison for uh, murder. Uh, I spent the next 16 years, uh, you know, in and out, uh, just getting in trouble in prison. I became a drug addict in prison. Uh, it was weird, I was riding a bicycle when I went to jail, and then I went, and I was in prison, and my first celly, like, he was shooting dope one night, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm getting high. I said, well, what does that mean? I didn't come from a, from a background uh, of alcoholics, drug addicts, stuff like that, so it was weird for me, you know? Uh, but I did help in the years to come to get all my brothers to do alcohol and drugs. So I taught them how to do something. Wasn't a smart thing to do, but 
uh, I became a drug addict in prison. So when I first got out of prison in 1990, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do was try to get into some kind of recovery because all I had known for 16 years while I was in prison was how to shoot dope. That's all I knew, you know. And for those of you that are probably looking at me like, well, how are you shooting dope in prison? Guess what? I mean, I shot more dope in prison than I've ever shot in my life. So just to let y'all know. But I got out, and so I was a chronic relapser for the next 10 or 11 years and kept going back to prison because I didn't understand why I had to report to some lady every month and let her know how I was doing. And then she made me pee in this cup. So I didn't like doing that. So the next four times that I went to prison was all on parole violations, which is stupid because, well, it wasn't stupid, it's because I was on drugs. Couldn't stay off drugs. Uh, so fast forward, moving forward to when I went, when I came into Oxford, uh, I was told by my parole officer that I needed to move in Oxford House. And I had asked her if she had totally lost her mind. I said, I'm not moving in with seven other guys. That's not gonna happen. And she said, well, you have a choice. Like you can move into an Oxford House or you can go back to prison. And my first thought was, I'll just go back to prison. Like, I know what to do there, you know? Like, all my friends are there. Most of my family is there. So I'm like, ooh, we'll have a big reunion. I'll go back to prison. So then I went home and I thought about it and I said, you know what? Let me give this Oxford House thing a shot, you know? So I moved into an Oxford House and my first question to her was, how long do I have to stay? And she said, ah, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe two. And I was like, okay, I can handle that. So I moved into my first Oxford house in San Antonio, Texas, uh, Fred Road House. I moved in 2009. And my first house meeting, I told those guys when we were sitting in the living room, I said, look, I don't like y'all. I don't want to be friends with y'all. And no, I'm not going to no meetings. Like, because they were talking about chapter meetings and all this other stuff. I said, I'm not going to no meetings. I don't want to be your friend. I don't like none of y'all. Well, three months later, I went to a chapter meeting and I was, uh, it's funny, Dan remembers it. Like I was, I was voted chapter chair <laughs> for my chapter. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I had met this bald guy from Oklahoma, Jackson Longin, and so I asked him, well, we went to the World Convention in Dallas, and I got with Jackson, Marty Walker, and James McClain. And I told them, look, I don't know what I'm doing. And they said, don't worry about it. Here's all our phone numbers. Call us anytime you need us. I said, all right, cool. Well, I get home. Two days later, Jackson calls me, and he says, oh, by the way, you're the state association chair, too. <laughs> I'm like, wait, no. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing with this chapter chair thing. Now you want me to be state chair. Now you gotta remember this. When I moved into Oxford, there was 52 houses in the state of Texas. There's 324 now. And so as, as the years came, went across and, and the years kept going by and I kept getting involved more and I kept getting involved more, my thing was like, I would go to the world conventions and everybody would talk about re-entry and I'm like, well, why don't we have re-entry in Texas? I'm like, what's going on? And so one day Jackson says, well, if you don't like it, that we don't have a re-entry in Texas, he said, well, why don't you work on it? Instead of complaining about it. I was like, okay. I don't know what I was doing. But you know what? Here's, here's the thing. The thing is, you know, we're talking about stigma earlier. You know, one, one of the worst people that judge people coming out of prison and people that judge, you know, just in general, alcoholics and drug addicts is guess who? Us. You know? 
you know, the new guy comes into the house or the new girl comes into the house and, and you're like, man, they're, they're going to be a load of trouble. Guess what? We are all a load of troubles when we got home, you know, when we first came to an Oxford house. So here's my thing. My thing is one, one of the things that I hear all the time is that houses don't want to do interviews for people coming out of jail or coming out of prison. Guess what? Earlier when they asked, who of y'all have not been to jail yet? And the ones that didn't raise your hands, right? You got lucky. <laughs> Let's be serious. Y'all got lucky. So the rest of us that have been to jail, have been to prison, why are we judging the people that are trying to come into our houses? We should not be judging. We should not be judging. We should be welcoming them with open hand. All right? And I just got to note that I'm out of time. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, let's just, I mean, we have to work together. And if we work together, we can make this thing work. All right? Thank you for having me. You're supposed to be slick. I was supposed to be able to get that off without everybody knowing it. <laughs> It didn't work. Okay, our next speaker. Um, I, got, I got a notification I was going to be moderating this panel, and we had a little Zoom meeting, and we got together. And it's really that I, I was told I'm, we'd met, ran into each other at previous conventions. And through this call, I could really tell that his heart is in the right place. I could tell what he's doing. He was tell, you know, speaking about what was going on in his house, and I was really glad to put a name with the face, even though we had met each other before. Um, our next speaker is George Block. George, George has been involved with the Oxford House for the last five years. He's held many positions within the Oxford House model. And he is the reentry coordinator for the great state of Washington. Mr. Block, would you like to come up and share for us? family. My name is George Bach. My person in long-term recovery, what that means to me is I haven't had the urge to use any mind-altering substances since 2015. Uh, I guess they say the worst for last. How about that? This, I am way out of water. I mean, I am a fish out of water standing before you guys. I don't do public speeding, speaking, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I went back into Oxford in 2016 after my fifth time being incarcerated. Uh, fortunately, I had tried Oxford before and I was unsuccessful. This time I went in, I went into a brand new house. Uh, I don't know how, maybe it's fate, and maybe it was just good luck. The house was not very established. We had some core members that were doing their best, but they were on their way out. And then, lo and behold, uh, I was the last one standing. They left me in control of the treasury, the comptroller, the everything seemed like just as okay. I've been here, what, six weeks? And now I'm the core member of this house. So I reached out to my outreach workers and they said, don't worry about it, we're gonna work through it. We'll get you through it. And lo and behold, things have happened. I took the reentry position shortly after that and I haven't looked back. I mean, with Oxford, so many doors have opened. I'm doing things that I wouldn't imagine I would ever be doing as far as the reentry goes. <clears throat> I mean, I guess I have at least 12 felonies, all drug related. Now I have the opportunity to go into the Benton County and Franklin County Jail and facilitate a program called the 192 program. Now, I'm not escorted in. I have a badge where I walk in and I walk freely through that jail. Uh, a 12-time felon walking in a county jail with no escort, with a badge to let yourself in and let yourself out. Now, that's truly amazing. That is really amazing. That's how God works and that's how when you're doing the right thing, right things happen. And just let the help help you. I've had 
tremendous help from my outreach workers all across the state of Washington. And whenever I have a call, when I'm doing my reentry stuff and it's out of my area, uh, they pick up the phone. Okay, George, who you got? What's his name? And uh, is he a sex offender or an arson? No, okay, then we'll take him. In our area, my, the houses that I work directly with, I'm also a state rep in the area, so I go to these houses on a regular basis. I take a look at them. I try to keep my funding and my self-paid at a 50-50 ratio. So all our houses are not always waiting on just funding to survive. Uh, with that being said, um, it's just truly amazing. I am so nervous standing up here looking at the crowd. I, the only time I had bright lights on me was when I was in the back of a car when that guy was coming up to me. <laughs> Can I see your ID? So this is really weird. But uh, thanks for letting me share. That's all I have. If you have some questions, I'll Thank you, George. You did great, man. You did awesome. He says he's all nervous, and he got me fired up. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, one of the things that what, what one of the things I wanted to touch on, and and you know, I was really thinking about it. I knew that I, I love grabbing a mic when I can. It's one of the things I enjoy. And and I was really thinking, if I get a couple of seconds to grab the mic, what am I going to say? Because I never thought I'd. It was such an honor to be moderating. I've always been sitting as a panelist on this, and and who knows, this might be my role, but. I, I really, um, you know, being around reentry for the last the last 12 years, 13 years, and involved with Oxford House and working with other states and other people, other residents all over the country. The one thing that the one thing that I know that hasn't changed was the advice that I was given when I first asked about it. Every state makes it look different. Sentencing laws are different in every state. Programs are different in every state. How we how we get people into our houses is different in every state. But I'll give you the same advice that was given to me years ago. And this is a, it's a resident run organization and we do have outreach workers in many cases that can help us. But if your rent is current and you do your chore and you pay your rent and you show up to the house meeting and care, you can be an active part of teaching our houses to understand that um, the, the majority, almost exclusively the majority of the time um, because someone came out of prison, as long as they have a, a primary substance abuse disorder and a desire to stay stopped, they fit right in seamlessly. What I've seen far too much is when we talk about judging people is that we're judging people that, ha that got caught or didn't get caught. And there was, um, we have to remember that our primary goal is housing and rehabilitative support for addicts and alcoholics. We're not there to house folks getting out of prison until they find their next move or, or in their drug court until they get violated. What we're there to do is help people find recovery. And I know I, I walked around prison facilities for years and, and I, what I saw most, most often with the people that I saw or was around is that they had a drug and alcohol problem and a, and, and a lack of programs to help with it. So don't be afraid to step out there and, and work with your outreach. And if you don't have them, I used to run around as a chapter chair with a business card with my phone number on it. So you can do that too. Um, we want to open this up for questions. We have some microphones up here. If you folks have any questions, we've got a few minutes. Now I will cut you off when the panel ends, but we'll answer as many as we can. You're up. Um, I've been in uh, Oxford House since 2015. Um, I'm, I'm doing re-entry for our chapter in New Mexico. I just want to know, uh, what's the next step that I can do to help more? I mean, um, I, I've, I just want to know, like, um, is there classes I can go to? Anything I can do to be of more service? Okay, I can't remember. Can you repeat that, please? I, I've been in Oxford House uh, for six years, going on seven. Um, I've been incarcerated most of my life, 49 times, I'm 52 years old, and I, I, I just help other people now. Uh, you know, I built a good relationship with the probation parole department mm -hmm. to where they call me to help uh, place guys coming fresh out of prison, but I wanna know what I can do uh, to be of more service. Is there classes I can take, or what can I do as a peer, a peer specialist, or what can I do? What's the next step? So, um, I mean, there's several different things that you can do, but again, like with, kind of my coworkers and kind of the residents too. Team, 
kind of build a team, a couple of you guys kind of start meeting together to see what it is that, you know, you're seeing when these people get out, yeah. what it is that they're needing and try to kind of like, I have a house that has a closed house in different areas. Um, you know, people go and try to get donations and kind of build some things together and then get the resources. Always check in with your reentry councils in the counties if you have them and see what new they're doing. More for the individuals. I know that one of the things, and I didn't speak about this, happens to be a problem, is the uh, driver's license or ID, Social Security Guard and birth certificates. And um, in our state, we have uh, North Carolina, um, I think it's, um, it's an ID project and it's with the Disability Rights Act. Get with that with your state and they've confined with their, they do applications and they help pay for the ones coming out for their birth certificate and social security card because that actually became more of a challenge since the pandemic has started. So some of those, because getting a job for us is, is kind of Hard, difficult. Yeah. So maybe beating some of those barriers so they can actually get a job a lot easier. Right. So just maybe getting some people that are willing to help kind of brainstorm and, and start from there. All right, if you have any more you. questions, I'm, I'm here for a couple more days, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jeff from San Antonio. Uh, so my question is, what would be the best way, in your opinion, and this is for anybody, um, to uh, begin and or strengthen a relationship between a drug court or a, uh, a treatment court program and the Oxford reentry program locally that we have? Yeah. I, I would. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you can take the mask. Yeah. Uh, best way is get close to it. I mean, ask to visit, uh, include them in your newsletters, uh, meet their peer support people, uh, show up because a lot of times, and usually it's not just showing up once, twice. It's like really trying to strengthen a relationship. Um, and it's, it's about, about that relationship and being there and being there consistently, uh, because I'm, you know how it is like the first, maybe once or twice you'll introduce yourself and they don't call. Uh, but just keep showing up and include them in your newsletter, show up at the graduations, uh, invite the people in the program. If you guys are having cookouts, if you're having gatherings, you know, the people in the program extend an invitation, you know, and above all, man, be so good. They can't ignore you, which is just take care of, prioritize your own recovery and everything else starts falling into place if you'll do that. That's my advice. And to tie into that, I, he, he was spot on there. And one of the things is, is, and you're talking about from the house perspective, correct? I mean, getting more folks into the houses? Uh, or just, uh, yeah, getting folks into the houses. One of the things that we, that years ago, I stole from Kansas is have them come to the houses. Kansas does these progressive dinners and things like that. Bring the drug court professionals and have them come look at the house and see what's going on in them. Invite them into the home. Let them see what you're doing. Go ahead. Um, my name is Andrew. It's Lyon, Kansas. Um, my question is, our house is full. We do reentry. And we got waiting lists, even though we're couching people. The other houses do not want to do any type of reentry because they don't even need to get to meet the person. So, you know, kind of met with them, you know, we'll just send them your way after they stay with their house. How do we go about approaching the houses to start taking people in because they, they, they flat out don't want to accept because they don't get to meet them? Well, I mean, at, at times I can say that's very challenging. Um, that's where uh, you're, you know, if you guys are struggling that, you know, bring the chapter. Again, groups to talk about something, to kind of advocate for somebody sometimes usually works. I actually have had challenges like that, but when I come in and the house kind of, I explain to them. And then I tell them my story. I'm like, this is where I came from. Do, do I seem like a bad person? Is it that horrible to let me get a bed in this house? I mean, it, sometimes it's hard, but democratically it, it is difficult. But if we talk about it constantly with chapter, bring it up, you know, get more people to understand and, and involved. You know, it does help. But outside of that, I mean, you just got to keep trying. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Clint, Overland Park, Texas. Uh, not Texas. I'm from Texas, but Overland Park, Kansas. Um, we have the women's with children's and the men's with children's, men's and women's on the website, vacancy website. Uh, my question is, is is there an option or could there be an option for a reentry on the vacancy website for the houses? I would uh, love that. <laughs> okay, I, I'll answer that question for you. And it's something that I've been taught over the years. I, I naturally thought that, you know, we have to avoid separation. Our houses for, are for addicts and alcoholics and they're voted in democratically. The only reason when there's any separation on our vacancy sites and things like that is that we're assisting children and that's to show that the house has children living in it at some capacity 
But just because we are no a reentry applicant, a drug court applicant, someone off the street, someone from the homeless shelter, someone that just walks in the door and interviews, we're all in the same boat. And and to point out, we don't want to we we don't want to 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 create any separation there. We're all we're all uh, members of Oxford House, regardless of what direction we came from. Good evening. I'm good afternoon. My name is Jason Turner. I'm in Seattle, Washington, Oxford House. Um, my 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 thing is, I went to prison at the age of 18 as well. I did 20 years. Right. I got out when I was 38 years old. I'm from California originally. I came up to Seattle in the midst of my addiction because I didn't know where to get any help from. There wasn't no help. And one of my family members suggested that I come out here. I do have a pending case in California. My question is, is there any kind of way that we can help people that are fighting criminal cases? Because I was in my, in my addiction, is there any way that we can help people get into a court kind of like thing, you know what I mean? Or get like a court treatment program instead of going, because I don't want to go back to prison, right? And, I'm, and there's a lot of men like me that made a mistake during my addiction, right? Because I have mental health issues as well, right? And uh, I was in a psychosis at the time and I was on drugs. And um, and and so they're, fi uh, they're, they're filing criminal charges against me, right? Yeah. When I believe that because of my addiction and because of my mental health, you know, it, I wasn't criminally minded at the time. I was just under the influence of of drugs, you know what I mean, and I was in psychosis at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't. I, I'm just asking, like, is there any way that Oxford House or the court system can bear, like, separate that, you know, so I can go back to California as I'm fighting this case and ask for the help that I need. Mm. You say, so you say, is there a way to Oxford House could, if, if someone has criminal charges, can Oxford help in some way? Essentially, I mean, that's a it's kind of layered and complex. I've been a criminal defense attorney also represented people and I mean, I just really would say depending on the situation, but the, the number one thing that I think um, it, Well, the, the, there are certain crimes that are just not statutorily not eligible for for certain kinds of treatment courts, at least in my state uh, mental health court tends to be a little bit, um, you, you know, um, more flexible. But as far as Oxford organization itself, maybe making sure that they're just aware of, of you know, here, here's my issue and then get as compliant as you can. When I say compliant, man, get sober, work a great recovery program and have a lawyer, have a lawyer that at least understands your addiction, document as much stuff as you can uh, so that it can be hopefully persuasive to a judge. But what you're trying to do hopefully is demonstrate to a court and a prosecutor that you're a person who is either worthy of probation. Look, you can be okay. Look, you are stable. You are, you, you know, this was a mental health episode as far as Oxford being able to be the one that was to, I had to give that some thought. I'm not sure there's an easy answer there. Thank you. And yeah. If I could just add to that, if, you know, I'm going to give you my business card and uh, all I can do is connect you with the state coordinator for California's collaborative courts, and they can let you know whether or not there is a court in the jurisdiction where your matter is that, that might be able to assist. I can do that for you, though, so I'm happy to give you a card. If you, if you reach out to me, I'll let you know. Okay. We have time for one more question, okay. folks. That's so, all we're going to uh, have time My name's for. Gary. I'm from Chapter 13 in Hutchinson, Kansas. So <clears throat> I am, I'm an alumni from a drug court program, so my question is kind of like, because I like to take stuff back, because like um, the drug court that I'm alumni from, they like to keep us involved, and I've got into some pretty heated debates with our um, drug court attorneys. So, um, so in your treatment program, or your treatment court program, does distribution automatically disqualify you from your drug court program? Distribution? It does yeah. not. Thank you. Yeah. That's all. That was my only question. And, and I will add to that that the, the, the adult drug court best practice standards specifically indicates that distribution loans should not be an automatic disqualifier. It is in some courts, but the research shows, because most of these aren't, aren't big, big time drug dealers. These are people who are distributing tied to their own use or the use of the people closest to them. So the, our adult standards indicate it should not be an automatic, automatic disqualifier. I want to thank you all for attending. We'll, we'll come back after lunch. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our panelists.